Welcome back to topic five. We're now in section two, where we're gonna zero in on the first type of compound, which is the ionic compound. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's the roadmap of where we're gonna end up heading. So in this entire topic, our goal is we are going to be able to learn to name and write all the different types of compounds that we'll see in this particular course. That's what we call nomenclature. Nomenclature is simply the naming rules and conventions that we'll use for the different types of compounds. We are going to be focused primarily on inorganic compounds and acids. The three main types are going to be ionic, covalent, and then we'll specifically talk about acids since acids have different naming conventions. The first part that we'll look at is this area right here on the left, which is falling underneath the ionic. All right, so let's get right into it. Ionic compounds are also known as salts. So when you hear salt, that doesn't necessarily mean sodium chloride. That means any ionic compound. But ionic compounds, are, or salts, are typically bonds between cations and anions, which often mean between a metal and a nonmetal. Sometimes a polyatomic ion will be part of it too, and we'll see that in just a little bit. But you can always tell by you're looking at an ionic compound because you can see that it's a cation bonded to an anion. Now what holds an ionic compound together? Well, you probably guessed it, an ionic bond. Makes sense, right? But what does that mean? What does an ionic bond mean? Well, ionic bonds are essentially electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged particles. In other words, you have a positive attracting to a negative. That makes sense. Well, how does that attraction happen? It happens through what we call a transfer of electrons. This is key to what an ionic bond is. An ionic bond results as a result of a transfer of electrons. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look at the famous example of sodium and chlorine. Back in a few topics ago, we talked about how sodium has one valence electron and chlorine has seven valence electrons, neither of which are happy. But if sodium were to somehow give its one electron and transfer it to chlorine, then sodium would now have a full octet, and so would chlorine. That makes sense, and that's why they bond together so well. Let's take a look at that in a different way. Right here I have the Lewis dot diagrams for both sodium and chlorine. And sodium having the one valence electron and chlorine having the seven valence electrons, sodium would transfer its one electron over here to chlorine. That results in sodium having the positive charge and chlorine now having the negative charge. And as a result, they will come together and they will attract, resulting in an ionic bond. All right, so let's take a look at some other examples of that. This is where we get into chemical formulas. A chemical formula, or sometimes we'll just say formula, indicates the ratio of elements in a compound based on bonding. In the example that we saw before with sodium and chlorine, it only took one sodium to fully satisfy one chlorine. But sometimes you need more than just a one-to-one -one ratio. For example, if you take a look at the bonding between lithium and oxygen, it takes two lithiums to fully bond with one oxygen. Why is that? Let's take a look at it real quick. Lithium has one valence electron, and therefore there's its Lewis dot structure. Oxygen has six, and so let me draw that real quick. As we can see, neither one of these elements are happy. And lithium, having only the one electron, is ready to easily give up that one electron and give it to oxygen. As a result, lithium is now positive one and happy. But oxygen is not happy. It's closer to happy, but now it has seven valence electrons instead of six. It still doesn't have a full octet. So when oxygen bonds with lithium atoms, it doesn't a one-to-one -one ratio is not going to work. Instead, we're going to need another nearby lithium to do the same thing and give its electron to oxygen. As a result, not only is this lithium happy, but now this oxygen is happy, getting the negative two charge that it needs. You can see other examples. There's a three-to-one ratio here between potassium and nitrogen for the same reason as what we saw over here with lithium and oxygen. And then if you were to bond aluminum and oxygen, that's a two-to-three ratio. Now, do you have to show this bonding over here every single time? No, we're actually going to see in this topic there's other ways that we can figure out how to determine what the formula should be. But nevertheless, the transfer of electrons still holds true. In example two, it's asking you to show the bonding or the transfer of electrons for the chemical formulas shown above. 
I already showed it to you for NACL and Li2O. It's asking you to do this same thing for the other two. See if you can do that. Pause the video and then just hit play to get the answers. All right, there are your answers. We already know how many of each element we need based on the formula. We're just simply drawing the elements with their Lewis dot symbol and then showing the electrons being transferred from one to the other. Potassium nitrate, or, or nitri, excuse me, is shown down here with three potassiums giving up their one electron to satisfy the one nitrogen. And then for the aluminum oxide, we have the two aluminums and the three oxygens. This one probably got a little messy and it's not shown very well here on the screen. But the idea is the six electrons that are coming from the two aluminums end up getting transferred amongst the three oxygens, and that's why it needs a two to three ratio. Let's talk a little bit about ionic compounds and their structure. You may recall from topic two, when we were talking about Avogadro's number, that we had what was called molecules, but then we also had that term called formula units, right? And at the time I said, don't worry about that. We'll get to it in topic five. Well, here we are, because ionic compounds actually do not exist individually by themselves as molecules. For example, let's take the NaCl compound. You would not see an Na bonded to a Cl in nature, and then that's it. You wouldn't see an individual NaCl molecule. Instead, all the sodiums, which are represented here by the silver, would be surrounded by all the chlorines, which are represented by the green. They actually build themselves up into these big crystals called crystal lattices, or sometimes we would say a lattice framework. So the idea is that ionic compounds don't exist as individual molecules. Instead, they exist as formula units. And a formula unit would be the Na and Cl, and then another NaCl, and then another NaCl, and so on and so forth. There's multiple formula units in this crystal. So ionic compounds exist as crystals. What else do we know about them in terms of their, their properties? Well, in terms of their shape, ionic compounds are solid at room temperature. Now, you can dissolve them in water, and we'll look at that later, but ionic compounds are going to come in the solid form. They typically have high melting and boiling points. That makes sense because they're solid. So we find that solids generally have high melting points and boiling points. It takes high temperature to melt and open, ultimately vaporize them. Also, because of their ions, they conduct electricity when in either molten or aqueous state. Molten means we have melted it into liquid. Aqueous means we've dissolved it in water. So on its own, solid sodium chloride, for example, table salt, will not conduct electricity. But if you were to melt it or dissolve NaCl in water, then it would conduct electricity because the ions would be free to move around. That goes right along with what we're talking about. Ionic compounds are soluble in water, but in terms of an organic solvent, they are insoluble. So an example of an inorganic solvent, which you'll hear a lot in science, is benzene. Benzene is an inorganic solid, or excuse me, benzene is an organic solid. So if I were to try to dissolve NaCl in benzene, it wouldn't work. Since we're talking about the structure of ionic compounds and the fact that they build themselves up into these crystal lattices, this is a great opportunity to talk about lattice energy. What is lattice energy? Lattice energy is defined as the amount of energy required to convert one mole of an ionic solid to its constituent ions in the gas phase. What? What does that mean? Let's take a look at an example. Every compound has its own lattice energy. Let's stick with the NaCl example. If you were to look up NaCl's lattice energy, either in a textbook or on the internet, you would look up that it has a lattice energy of roughly 788 kilojoules per mole. What does that mean? Well, if you had one mole of NaCl, which, by the way, is about 58.44 grams, that's the molar mass, let's say you had that 58.44 grams of NaCl on a dish, and what you wanted to do is you wanted to provide enough energy to turn all of this NaCl into sodium gas and chlorine gas. And you may be thinking, you can do that? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And specifically, how much energy would you have to put in to do it? 788 kilojoules. So it takes 788 kilojoules of energy to convert one mole of NaCl to Na gas and Cl gas. 
Another way to look at lattice energy is this. The higher the lattice energy, the stronger or more stable that that particular ionic compound is. So let's take a look at a table that has various ionic compounds and their respective lattice energies. Take a look at potassium iodide, for example. It's about 632. Compare that to magnesium oxide, which is about 3800. This would tell me that magnesium oxide is much stronger or more stable of a compound than potassium iodide. Now, what if I didn't give this table to you? What if I asked you to determine, based just simply on a chemical formula, what compound would have a higher lattice energy? There are some tricks or some trends that we can use to figure that out. The two things you want to look at are magnitude of charges, and then, if you have to, look at ionic radius, or in other words, the distance between the nuclei. I always look at the magnitude of charges first because that's the most important. If all the charges are the same, then I would look at the size. So let's take a look at this. First thing is magnitude of charges. The higher the charge, the stronger the attraction, and ultimately, the stronger the lattice energy. In the pictures, it's kind of small, so let me write it out here to the side. We have three compounds shown, lithium fluoride, magnesium oxide, and scandium nitride. If I were to look at the magnitude of charges, lithium is plus one, fluorine's negative one. Magnesium is plus two, oxygen's negative two. And finally, scandium is plus three, nitride is negative three. Do you see how the magnitude of charges are very low for lithium fluoride, but really high for scandium nitride? It makes sense then that lithium uh, fluoride here, lattice energy is about 1,000 but the lattice energy for scandium nitride is about 7,500, much larger. So if your magnitude of charges are larger, that would result in a stronger attraction. But what if all the charges are the same? Like for example, let's say we're looking at lithium iodide compared to sodium iodide compared to potassium iodide. If I were to look at the charges for all of these ions, they all have the same charge. They're all plus ones and minus ones. So magnitude of charges isn't going to help me here. Instead, I now have to look at ionic radius. What do we find? When a compound has the same cation but different anion or vice versa, we have found that as the distance between the nuclei increase, the attraction between those two ions decreases and therefore weakens the lattice energy. I like the analogy of the good old classic game Red Rover, which apparently is banned. But you might remember as a kid playing Red Rover. If you wanted to create a really strong bond so someone couldn't break through, you'd get really close, right? But the further you were from apart, maybe you were holding hands really far, that's easy to break through. It's the same thing with ions. If the ion nuclei are close together, that's going to create a very strong bond. So let's take a look at this example. Obviously, the one thing that's in common between all three of these is the iodine. So we need to take a look at the cation, lithium, sodium, potassium. We notice lithium is the smallest, sodium is the next largest, and potassium is the largest out of all three. We could know this based on the periodic trend we learned in topic four. So what does that mean? Well, considering lithium is really small, its nuclei is going to be closer to iodine than, let's say, potassium. And so since lithium is closer to iodine because of its small size, its lattice energy is about 732 compared to 632 for potassium iodide. So the closer the nuclei are together, or in other words, the smaller the ions, the stronger the attraction. So let's finish this video with example three. The following picture represents alkali halide salts. Alkali meaning all the cations are alkali metals or positive one. Halide means all the anions are negative one. Salts just means they're ionic compounds. So knowing all that, which salt would have the highest lattice energy? Well, since we know every single ion in these pictures are all going to have the same charge, we have to go based on size. And looking at the size, letter D has the smallest ions out of all four options. Therefore, letter D will have the highest lattice energy. That's it for section two. We'll see you in the next video in section three.